Hello guys, welcome to this episode of Tanaya Wasani and today we have Dr. ZP. Yeah. Want to celebrate you in your own right because you're uh, the artist, the artist. If not every day I get this kind of a horn, I am. Tell us how you began in this career because I know you're, you're, mm. you're a woman in the film industry. Now we're in Dr. the doctor of film. You're the first one in Kenya, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I am the first one from a Kenyan university. Yes, congratulations. Yes. But from you, how did you begin? Uh, you know, my, my journey, let me say, as a performing artist. Yes, as a performing because artist. What? Because there are levels you know, to this I started as a musician in this industry. I so. Yes. So, uh, I started as a musician. I, first of all, I studied drama and theater studies at Masena University. That's from 2000 to we graduated in 2005 because there was some strike. We, hmm. <laughs> yeah, we are good students. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, I joined the industry officially. In 2003, I did uh, a song. It's called Nanilia Busume. That was the first song what? where there was a girl in a bathtub in Kenya. Are you serious? <laughs> With bubbles. Kuna vi, kuna vi YouTube. Mimi atasiji. I know, YouTube. Because this time, it was not an era. Mimi atasiji. <laughs> That sounds like a nice thing. It sounds like a nice thing. But I think I know one person who could be having it. Mm-hmm. Like Nation, mm-hmm. Alex. The guy is called Alex. He used yes. to work for the beat. Okay, I should be having some tips somewhere or in TV because it really used to play on the beat. Mm-hmm. I think I should follow up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in 2003, I, I did Nalilia Busu. Then we did another song on HIV called ABC mm-hmm. with uh, some guy who's called, Ru- he was called Ruby. He's nowadays in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And then in 2006, I became a finalist for Spotlight on Kenyan Music with um, Akina Sauti, so that was the second edition. Hey! So you were on the same album. Hey! Yes. Yeah, you were a big deal. I mean, I was, if it was not for... Like, you know, Sauti Soul, you get what you... What do you mean? Up to now. but you're still here. So, you know, destiny. Yeah. That's a big one. Yes, <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I've also, in the theater side, I also have done works with people like Victor Bell, Sami Mwangi when I started. And then uh, I think my biggest shot in terms of theater was a show I did with the Kenyatta University in 2013 when we were celebrating Kenya at 15. It was called Come Back My Love. It was big. I think it was the biggest musical that year. And uh, we even performed it at the university. We had many gigs, and we performed at the National Theatre on a three-day run because um, the former NTV uh, uh, CEO liked it so much and said he's taking it to the theatre. And uh, for me, it was like the theatre was getting closed for innovations that time, but they said for this one. We just... So we were the last performance at the National Theatre before it went into renovations for that time in 2013. Oh, God. Yes, and uh, that, it woke me. It woke me like, Zippy, why are you playing small? Why are you, why are you playing small? Why are you, why, is you, why are you dreaming too small? Why are you dreaming too small? I was like, look at the work you've done. Guys are looking at it like, wow, this is big. And I think from there, I started thinking like really big about what I have in my hand <laughs> and the talent. When you were studying properly, this is what you wanted to become. Did you envision this for yourself? Um, not, but I envisioned something, something close. I wanted to be a broadcaster. Yes. I wanted to be Catherine Casabuli. When watching Elizabeth Omolo. Those two women, I just wanted to be them. Not even like them. I wanted to be them. Yeah, yeah like I wanted to come to Nairobi, live in Nairobi, be a broadcaster. That would be it. I mean, that's it. By the way, right now, that's it. Me, I don't even want to go live abroad to do anything. Me, I want to live in Nairobi forever. But you are so qualified in your overqualified in your terms. No, 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 no. Nairobi is the place. Nairobi I don't think, is. um, I don't think, in fact, when somebody wants to go to Europe, America right now, I tell them, what are you going to do there? I mean, this is where everything is. Yeah. Because right now we are in the custodian of the knowledge and we need to make it work. Yeah. We yeah. need to work on breaking. Exactly. Yes. It's better to be at a place that's having a lot of growth potential than to be in a place that's already established. Because uh, here there's a thousand, a thousand opportunities. You just have to risk it all. Are you ready to risk it? I mean, they risked it. <laughs> <laughs> And you are risky. Yeah. Oh my God. So how did you progress after the theater? How did you go to the next? When did you want? So I'm still in theater, largely. Theater is my first love. 
you did um you did a theater pro the theater production uh, two months ago yes that that was my fourth one woman show it was huge mm-hmm. it has to be hey. you ever go big or you go home no or go big oh no fuck it i love that <laughs> you ever go big or go big or go big so how do you how did you handle um the best step after now knowing what the potential you had or the potential you had in your life uh after campus after my first degree i i wanted to do my first film immediately yes what did you do in in college a drama and theater studies oh. which is like you're majoring in theater but we had some minors on film like directing or film directing which film campus in masena university it was the first one that was offering uh theater arts mm-hmm. especially for tv and film because moi was offering theater art but on a tf like theater for development style I tried to raise funds for my first film mm-hmm. i didn't manage But then I met this lady she was called Elizabeth and she had a great idea and she had money and she allowed me to direct her first film which never came out it was called Excuse Me Teacher. Oh, uh-huh. I had this excitement we directed a beautiful film then we had another guy who was ready to edit it he was called Sami but I think the lady was not she was a teacher she was not film trained she said the guy was taking too long to edit. Oh god. And too long by the way was less than one month. Of course, it's a film because it's not your film is very thin three years. It was less than one month. So she took her film to River Road and they chopped it. And I said I cannot talk Are about you? this film again. Oh, you need for me. I remember my name. Imagine. Yeah, I was sad. That was hard. I was very sad. Actually, we had gotten a slot in the paper saying this movie is coming out it's called Excuse Me Teacher. You know, I was already an artist in 2003. You already So, I was already having a following. I mean, I turned on a social media. Wait, wait, wait. You know, the Zeti Kovana. I had You had your own drama book. Yes, though. yes, I mean. And then I did um there's a, a play called A Catholic Girl's Guide to Breaking Your Virginity. Yeah. So that um, that that it was written by some lady in the states I asked her for her permission and uh, she gave it to me and uh, we did it and uh, then I did contract love musical also it was a musical on stage Contract love was a musical on stage It was fast a stage musical yeah before the movie before the movie when <laughs> okay 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 uh-huh. Yeah contract love was fast a stage musical before the movie Yes Yeah. It's very interesting. Very. Is it on YouTube? Um, no, no, that's not on YouTube. I would have loved to see yeah, it. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. But they, that's a script that I really, I love it. Like it's it's dear to you. It's, it's dear to me. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. It breaks the boundaries of love. Contract love. Yes, it does. Yes. It does. I, do you direct all these things or you just I I I direct. I used to script a lot. Nowadays I don't script a lot. What I do is uh I co-write. I, what I do is um I write my my story like my story outline fully 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 then I work with a scriptwriter uh to do the first draft then now I you flip it into I flip it in. Yeah, so now then I I polish I put in my you know Something about words is uh, even if you want to describe this thing here we will all want to describe it the same way. So that's why I give it to a scriptwriter and once they give it back to me I feel is it a language that I understand because I write for I say I write for commoners. Yes. Uh, so I don't like scripts that have got English that I have to google. No, um, yes. True. True. Yes, I want scripts that are easy for everyone to understand, timeless, and um, has a touch of humor. Whether it's dark humor, yeah. but I feel, I feel most of your movies speak, are dark humor. Yeah, dark yeah. humor, <laughs> but they're I'm, targeted to women. We yes. can tell a lot of stories about. I'm women. very intentional about women. It came as a coincidence, by the way. First of all, it came as a great coincidence. Uh, my intentions. on working women issues i didn't know it until late first i i even did a, a song on fgm mm-hmm. in one in my album yeah and then even the works that i was writing uh even in campus you know we had a lot of script writing lessons and all that mm-hmm. a lot of them about women you know like a woman gender based violence a girl struggling having of speaking up and all that a lot of my scripts are on that yeah 
And um, then I went and did my master's in gender and development. And I realized for me, it's more than that. There's, there's something just driving me. Into telling this. Into telling about women, speaking for the women. Because uh, we, we often don't speak because we've been suppressed. Our thoughts have been suppressed. And uh, I use my art to do that. Uh, even my one woman shows. So people ask, why am I doing one woman shows? I'm like, one. Yeah, like uh, wives they take. Yeah, yes. side chick wives. Side chick so Yes. Like there, there was a diary where it was two months. Stranger in my bed. The strange voices. A hopeless romantic. Then side chick wife. When I ask anyone to, to share the stage with me, they can't. People want to tell stories that are not their own. So I'm like, yes. if you're not sharing your own story, then you're not sharing yes. the stage. Is that Those comes. The, yeah. You know, the, the sweetest story is your own story. Yes. It's the true story. Yeah. But people are scared because what will people say? I mean, what will people say? They have already said it. How did you shed your vulnerability to be able to share your life stories in terms of stories and curate them in terms of plays and dramas and films? Because oh, whatever you know. we are scared of, people have already said it and seen it. Interesting. Yeah, we are just scared to accept the fact that people already know. Let me say, when I first got divorced, people already knew I, I was divorced, right? So me sharing it out there, what does it change? For me, it changes the fact that you can't gossip about me anymore. Because I told you my truth. And in your own words. In my own words. But the beautiful thing is, after the show, people come to you and say, that was my story. Yeah, that was my story. I felt like you're speaking to me. That is my sister's story. Oh, I should have my sister watch this. Even men come and tell you, oh, I felt like I was in your shoes. And as much as people can come and tell me, oh, ZP, you're sharing too much. I'm like, there's never too much. Because the truth is, we are normalizing pain. Yes. And we should not normalize pain. So I, I am an activist. I use my films. Midlife crisis. Midlife crisis was very... Midlife crisis is a real story. It it's a real like story, story of, so... uh, of friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm divorced. <laughs> I'm truly... I'm truly Colette in the movie. I think in every aspect... aspect. Of it. I am Colette. <laughs> that, that was my voice. No, <laughs> that you say it, I that, feel. No, you say it. Because it is. I tried to tell her something with this but I watched yes. it and I'm like, hmm. I actually Colette. You know, nice. you are divorced. The society still expects so much from you as a mother, but you're like, I also want to get my life back. Back together. Yeah, that man is dating again, moving on his life. Why can't I date again? Because the society is judging me. And I have a friend who's a spinster, and I have a friends who are married, but they are fucking tired. When I do works of art, I, I portray that because art is a reflection of reality. Yeah, so if that mirror can't show this reflection, then it's not art. That's why even an abstract painting, like what we have back here, I mean... Each of us, when we look at it, we see different things because it's a reflection of our own realities. So for me, my, when you watch my films, when you watch my theater shows, I speak my truth in them. And since there's no one unique in the world, I mean, each of us, they say, has seven replicas. Yeah. Seven. In the world. There are seven. Me. Sheila's. Yeah. Not the same the name, but... If all the people in the world were to be lined up, we'll find people who look exactly like you. Character, face, everything. And so imagine, now live alone looking alike. There'll be many people who have gone through you the exact same kind of story you're talking about. And you're speaking for them through the movie. That's why we like watching romantic films because it's either what we have experienced or what we fantasize about. The long to experience. Yeah. What? It's not true. Like you can be on the airport. You know, when we go to Ghana, see if you're back in Kaguka, then like home, and you can see if you're in the air. Eh? We want that. But it doesn't happen in the end. You can see if you're in the air, you can see if you're in the air. And that is another fast of the reality. Exactly. So you're like, we could also be in the air. 
Ni ngo jua vitabu kikira una bebo kumbe una bebo na bebo na Exactly. Oh, yeah. Wow. So there's nothing new. Everything. At what point did you did you discover that you needed therapy? What happened to you that you're like, you know what? Yeah. I need to take a step back. I need to understand what is happening. Then we can reconsider. Recon- after my first divorce, I went for therapy. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. After my first divorce, I went for therapy because um, first, I'm very spiritual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not religious. Not religious. Spiritual. It's I'm important. Well, I've, 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 I've not met a filmmaker who's told me they're religious. I yeah. They found mm, one. There is a... You know, spirituality and religion are quite closely related. The only problem is that we have... Uh, Religion has got a lot of doctrines that uh, some of us cannot try to like, you have to go to church every day, every Sunday and stuff like that. I mean, so I'll say I don't go to church every Sunday, but I go to church. But I really believe in God. I pray a lot and I believe in intuition and I, yeah. I usually tell myself that yeah. when I'm going through an episode that I can't, I can't get out of it soon yeah. enough, I yeah. channel that energy into something that I can see in future. Exactly. Like, when I look back, I'm like, yeah. I put my energy in there. Yeah. It's worth it till yeah. today. Yes. So I went back. I went, started doing theater shows and I started doing like even film shows. Yeah. I, I started by doing short films. Like, of course. That's yeah. Of course. I mean, more than I said, I'm, I said, I said, why am I doing short films? There's no business return. return. Yeah. There's no business return. When it comes to business, the first person who taught me about business is my mother. All credit to her. My mother was a business person, like, until her time of her death. She did all businesses. She taught us about business from a very young age. And so if, for me, even as a filmmaker, I understand the value of money. And I think that's, maybe that's what makes me feel different. Yeah, because in our industry, not very many people understand money and, and, and the arts. Yeah. You're either in one, you're either doing the art you can't and then separate. you have someone at the money. We can't separate it. And that's why I tell you, Paul, you have to go to school because if you don't go to school, you'll always want to be an artist. But you need to understand even a little bit. How did you learn about that financial? your artist is money? Financial aspect of uh, arts. How did you learn it? In which school did you go to? Google University. Yeah. Film universities are there are few. I mean, I studied theater arts. Yeah, uh, there is in there are, in the syllabus there was a, a unit called marketing, marketing for theater and film. Actually, two two units. There's advertising for theater and film. There's producing. Producing teaches you a thousand things about budgeting. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. La, yeah. Well, then you for a fact not very many filmmakers in Kenya have mm-hmm. gone to school. We all yeah, that's a fact. Yeah. YouTube University. Yes. And you can... And that one is the craft. Kenyans, we are... We are I, may I say, our technical skills are very high. But uh, we can... We, we, there are many reasons why the industry is not moving. But um, one, one of the reasons of this... Yes. One of the reasons... We, we don't have money. Yeah. We have financing. But we also don't have financing because we don't understand the money. Yes. So, so uh, how do we get our artists to finance literally and the way around? Because we need... I think mean, <laughs> as we speak right now, artists are suffering because we don't know how to monetize our... Uh, not many artists are suffering. Uh, yeah, some. I mean, so, I mean Ruben Alanga is paying people well, I mean. Yeah, hey, Ruben. Well, yeah. Ruben. Ruben. I am here. Ah, ah, ah. I am here. Oh, but yeah, how do you translate or how do you pass on the knowledge between art and finance and, finance and art? Considering, say, yeah. unakutana, like with... People mm-hmm. who've made their name in the industry, but they still don't know how to monetize their art. Mm-hmm. How do you, what do you tell them or how do you advise them to move forward? Where can they get this education? First of all, be eager. You must be eager about something. With all the education that I've had, eh, mm-hmm. I went to do Centonomy Entrepreneurship class. You get what I mean? Yes. So, because I am eager to know more about money, it's not that it even you are not taught. No, sometimes you just have to to want to know more because things change. Yeah. yeah, just like, I mean, the cameras we were taught with, I know the cameras that people are using right now. Mm-hmm. And you can say, you know, our teachers, you know, teachers using the right cameras. I mean, cameras are evolving. There was no red at that time and stuff, but right now we have to use them. It's about being taught the techniques. So you need to keep understanding tax, understanding interest, understanding loans, understanding funding, budgeting. It's 
you have to be hungry for that knowledge. Like there is going to school and school at different levels, like getting a diploma, a degree, but there's also doing just the usual professional short courses to understand. If you want to understand money, you have to go study money. You you can't understand money by talking to the ZP. Yeah. You have to go to the source. Go and just understand how money works. Like money is an attitude. Understanding money is about changing your whole attitude about money. What do you tell about what do you really tell artists will say? I'm only I'm the broke artist because artists always say, I'm broke because I'm in my Stop saying money. you're broke out of bone. You are welcoming negative energy. Yeah. I'm very patient. I mean yes. I feel I'm not broke. You're not never broke. I'm not broke. I'm never broke. I'm never broke. I'm the last me on the measure. I mean what? What? Of what you speak up so if you say you're broke it will come. No, no, you're not broke. Right? We are rich. 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 Yeah, so we need to, we need, to, we have to believe that there's money in the arts and that way we do it. Like, right now we are doing this podcast. We have to believe that it's going to hit 100,000 views. Yes. Yeah. Go off the road. We have to. We have to. But uh, if we don't believe that, then uh, we can't attract the energy. Yeah, we, money loves money. Money loves money. Yeah. Oh, it does, it does. Money attracts money. Money attracts money. Yeah. So... You have to look for your key smart. You know what? You have to find stuff. You find it. Like some of us, you know, there are, there are interviews that I specifically have some clothes I wear or scarves. I know this is my good luck scarf. You get what I mean? Yeah. Because when you wear it, you look rich. You and everything rich. comes to you. Everything comes to you. <laughs> I think that you wish you come to you. Yeah. It's, it's, but it's, it's that, just the thing I was like, let me see. When you walk into a room, even the way you walk, it's not about, nobody knows how much you have in your pocket, yeah? You could be having 50 bob or zero or 10,000 or 100,000 in that bag. Yeah. But the way you walk in will make people believe whether you're wealthy or not. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's, it has got nothing to do with what you have. It's about how you make your appearance. And that's something you, my mother used to say, it's better to overdress. To underdress. Yeah. But people fear to overdress like, hey, what what are you I want to work on the layer. And plus you can layer out like you should never tell you. Moja, remove another layer. There's no nothing of removing layers. Keep them on. All My dear. Yeah. Oh, boy. You know, like, Mudoni Drama Queen? Yeah. I love her fashion. I'm like... Layers on layers on layers <laughs> and the hair. I mean, walk into a room and let everybody feel your presence. That's and that's how you attract money. That's, a, that's what you do. Yeah, that's, that's how you attract money. Who inspires you? What, who's your role model? Who inspires you? Yeah, because you feel like many you don't have time. Many, many people. I, many people. Yeah. yeah. Locally, internationally. Locally, okay. Olive Mogenda, Professor Olive Mogenda. I think that one inspires me. Um, she's very hardworking, focused, ambitious. And uh, above all that, she still has a human touch. Fantastic. Yeah, and when you get close to her, I've worked close to her, you can feel like she's still, I love her. <laughs> and you see her on the papers, so I'm, I just know that she's an iron pisted woman, but. Yeah, so that's someone who's inspired me, Professor Wangari Mwai. Uh, she taught me in undergrad, then again, she was my PhD supervisor. I love her. Internationally, I love Oprah Winfrey. I want to be Oprah Winfrey. You're heading there, don't worry. Yeah, not even in the aspect of having an Oprah Winfrey show. No business. Yeah, wise. yeah it takes a lot of discipline. You know, the other day I was listening to, I listen to her a lot, by the way. I listen to Oprah a lot, like, like a lot. Almost every two weeks, not every week. And, uh, you know, she was like, even in her dating life, she says, She's the kind of woman, like, a man can just come and say, let's go for a drive. Then she'd ask, where? Then, like, I anywhere. She's like, no. <laughs> we have to know the destination. And I'm like that, by the way. So there's no for a normal, like, let's get it. No, the lack of part is, let's go. But where? 
Where? The yeah. Yeah. And there are no bodies we can take whichever route, but we must know where we are going. Yeah. Because, you know, that's how peer pressure works. If you don't know where you're going, and uh, I'm not adept to peer pressure. But uh, I think I've evaded peer pressure almost all my life. How? But, did you, but you were very shy, so that means you were keeping to yourself? I was, yeah, I was shy. I, ha- I always have very few friends. You? You must. Okay. I have many people oh, who love me yeah. and I love them and I smile to a lot of people, but people who can spend uh, a whole afternoon with me chatting and we share anything, there are very few. Yeah, and um, yeah, so for me, my my sort of interesting things uh, are not very interesting to many people. Like, I mean, watching movies to it. <laughs> Or well, maybe a filmmaker, you don't watch movies to watch movies. You watch movies to get ideas. No, imagine me. I watch movies just to enjoy movies sometimes. Really? Yes. I find it so hard. No. I love watching movies. You, you retrain your mind. Readjust. I love watching movies. I love cooking and I love hosting people. I know you love cooking. You are a good cook. I am a very good cook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love cooking to bits and I love hosting visitors. And uh, I don't know. I love simple things. Which makes it very hard for people because when people see me, they're like, Zippy, where are you partying today? And I'm like, I'm at home. What? And you're like, all this energy at home. Right? Imagine that's, yeah. that's the thing. Like, what people see is always totally different. And I was like, myself, okay, what do I show people? I'm always just going to work and going home. But people just believe when you're this bubbly, you must be getting some that energy from other things. I get it. But I'm like, um, I don't know. Where do you channel your energy from and where did it come from, considering you're a very shy little girl? Mm, shy people are very observant. For me, it's uh, more of the easy, quiet stuff, like chatting with the friends, having a drink, gossiping. Gossiping is good. Oh, yeah, it's good for the soul. Right? <laughs> yeah. Gossiping is good. I love gossiping. <laughs> it makes us think that your life is not that trash, you know? Exactly. Like, it gives you... And, and a better standing. Yeah, and, 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 and for a writer, yeah. you get your stories. You get it? Like if I'm writing now, I know. I like Sheila's character. She's going to be the same, so in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So you'll. You pick, you pick you characters pick up. You pick characters up. up and you put it all together. Like I, 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 I'm always on Facebook a lot. Not IG. IG does not have stories. It has pictures. Uh, yeah. But. On Facebook, people write stories and stories and you pick all that and that's how you know, mm, if I do this kind of show, it's going to hit because this is the kind of story that like my target audience, women love. Yes. So, yeah. Because my mom watched um, Midlife Crisis. Yes. You're like, oh my God. Okay. He didn't say much. He just said, oh my God. I mean, she couldn't see like, her daughter. She couldn't oh, ask her. But I'm like, okay, so okay, she doesn't watch films, but yeah. this one in particular, she actually related to. And I'm like, okay, I guess. Mm, like, I mean, You're when uh, and... when Alice, the married one, says, I mean, men with um, names from the Bible are. Uh, <laughs> but yes, but yes, but no, but yes. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but it's the reality, and these are things that women need to talk about. Yeah, but, you know, we are brought up to believe that we shouldn't share, we shouldn't talk about it. And uh, so my shows, my plays, my films give people a voice. The way you're told you can't talk about this, if you speak about it, it means you are the bad one, you know. I call it, um, you are pushing the blame to the victim because the victim is talking about it. You get it? Yes. Yeah, you, you know that these, uh, I mean, I've been divorced. And cohabited again and uh, separated. You know, when you are not married, you can't call it divorce. But uh, the thing is, you are stigmatized for by, like me say, the society and, the, and they, they do it unknowingly. Like, oh, the one who moves on fast was the abuser. Mm-hmm. The one who talks about it was the abuse, abuser, you know, those kind of stuff. And you're like, that's how you make victims shut up. No, we're tired of shutting up. We are. Yeah, people need to speak up. And also for the children. Which children? We have children. Those children need to know that when it's hard, 
when it's it's hard and I don't mean it because someone or of us is poor or not financially stable. When it's hard because somebody is getting abused, then they have the power and the confidence to walk out. Whether as a boy or a girl, no one should stay in an abusive relationship. And for me, that's the one thing. And I do it for my kids. I live for my kids, for myself. So when people say, stay for your kids, I live because I have girls. Yes. They need to know if things are hard, I can walk out. And it's it not like you don't teach them to stand abuse. You don't teach them. No. To, you teach them to be self-aware enough to walk away. Yes. From the, yeah. Yes. There's, there's a, the, when people say persevere, pers- there's, there's a difference between persevere. Persevering means like going to work every day because you know you have to pay your rent. That is persevering, yes? Persevering means sticking with, uh, in marriage, sticking with this man or this woman, sex life is boring and all that, but he's nice. Yeah. You get it? Yes. But if uh, someone is cheating here, beating you yeah. there, that is not perseverance. That is abuse. You get it? Yeah, because you know, sometimes people are trying to do things together and it's not working, but they're nice people. But if somebody is uh, doing all these things outside there but can't do them here, then that's now abuse. And people need to understand abuse. Like right now, people are on the 16 uh, days of activism. I keep saying to myself and any forum I go to, it's not about policies. It's about training people to be self-aware. If, Sheila, if you're not aware that somebody is emotionally abusing you, you won't know, you'll continue. You'll continue staying in the emotional abuse, being depressed, being stressed, saying he'll change with the time, let me give him time. No. Because what happens is when you're in an abusive uh, relationship, even for me, your output goes down. When did you find your voice? When did I find my voice? The very first time I found my voice, I think I was in compass. I used to have a very deep voice. Mm-hmm. Deeper than what you can hear. Me, I think it was deeper. And one time, there's this guy was called Professor Okomo. We were told to do projects and I said, I can't sing. He said, you can sing. So he and Mr. Otumba Oko insisted that I am going to sing. And I was scared. That was the scariest day of my life because I grew up everywhere. You know, when you're in high school, primary, we would say, hey, your voice is big. Is there a man in this class? And and they laugh at your deep voice. But the day I sang, I can't work. The hall was pain, draw, silent. And it scared me. I was like, God, why are they so quiet? Did I, did I, did I? Yeah, did I mess up or anything? But when I finished that song, I actually sang the Sound of Music song in that play. I was, you wait, little girl, you're an empty pay. That man will want to write on. You are 16, going on 17, baby, it's time to think. Better be well, be cunning and careful, baby, you're old and old. You know, I was like, the whole thing. And I think that day I found my voice, my singing voice, but also the confidence to know that that thing that people criticized the most about me was this powerful. So for people, it was a voice. For me, it was, why did they say my voice was big? Why did they say my voice was bad? Like. It took you so long to realize that particular thing. Exactly. Like I, I can sing. Like I come from a singing family. Let me start from there. So you hadn't, you had, had you sang in your bathroom before or you're just singing in a secret bathroom? Well, well it's like a secret because of the other, do you have anybody who comes in a beat voice? It's just four nights. I used to do vo- verses, you know, and all oh, that kind verses. of stuff, choral verses and yeah. stuff. But that's it. Yes. So the first time I sang, that was in Campus. The, the world stood. Yes. And I think, let me tell you, the, when I did my first song, I think people in my high school didn't believe it was me because, I mean, they used to be, Zippy, the one with a big voice, you know. And it was the, the song, the chorus of the song was, Nina uma moyo, ni papa sero, na liliya, busula komo jatu. Na 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 liliya, na liliya. Na na na. That was the chorus. 
This sounds like a thought. It's all a hook. As in, yes. Wow, Dr. CP. That's all very fun. And then, yeah. So, and uh, right now in all my films, I use original scores because I believe in the power of original music. Yeah. And you can create it. I can create it and I, I work with other people. I, I talk to artists and I tell them, can I use your song? And we talk and we discuss. I mean, when I can pay, I pay. When I can't pay, we talk. It a BD. <laughs> yeah, but I use original music. I don't believe in downloading backtracks. True. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure even when you talk to Kenyan artists, they're going to give you something. They will. And I mean, you can also just go to the studio and let them play some things on the keyboard, on the right. guitars and stuff. Yeah. And uh, why download music? And why, why listen to a song that's not from Africa and say, that one sounds African. We can use it. In the, it does not sound African. It was not it was, done in Africa was, yes. or by an African. Doesn't Create happen. African and use them on the films. Yes, let's use our own raw talent in Kenya. Yeah, our raw talent, talent in Kenya. Kenya. Yes. How would you define success? Have you attained it? Have you reached it? Have you touched it? Have you tasted it? Hello. Uh -huh. Success is in the mind. Yeah. yeah. Success is in the mind. Because uh, anytime you set your target, once you reach it, you want more. It's human nature. Yeah. So... I have reached where I wanted to be 10 years ago, but I have not reached where I want to be in my life now. Okay. Like, I mean, I'm 39. When I was 29, I wanted to be this. Mm -hmm. And maybe more. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, each year, I think I can be more. So right now, I am a successful version of 29-year-old ZP, but I am not a successful version of 39-year-old ZP. That's okay. Yeah. Then that's okay. That's you read the sky and then you go to the space and then you keep going further and further. Yeah. So, but I believe success is in the mind. Don't set yourself goals that you can't attain right now. And I think that's, that's, people talk about mental health problems. I, a lot of, a lot of times I think sometimes we are also just putting issues. Let, let's, there is mental health, but there is lust. Yeah, let, let's, let people are having mental health issues because we are lusting of uh, being like Zippy without wanting to be in Zippy's journey. Yes. Yeah, we want to be like Sheila without being in Sheila's journey. I mean, I also walked from uh, railways to University of Nairobi going for classes. I, I also survived on one meal a day. I mean, right now I'm doing one meal a day for health reasons though, but... Eh? Ah, your time it was by force. Your time it was by, by force. You get what I mean? I, I was very lucky. My first job, I was being paid 21000 Why? That's a lot of money. That's then. a lot of money then. But do you know, I used to use 6000 per month and say 15000 Nice. Yes. And that's how I paid for my master's. Then someone comes and tells me, you're lucky. I worked hard to save for my master's. You worked. You I did a scholarship for my master's. Yeah. I saved for it. Wow. Like I could, uh, I was living with my aunt, God bless her. But in the morning I could take uh, like Matatu, you know, from her place. But in the evening I could walk from Hallingham to her place in Lovington. That's not five. And it's, it's a walkable. Okay then. It's, uh, even now it's five. It's like <laughs> how many kilometers is it? It's like, I mean, walking around three, four kilometers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So walking four kilometers in the evening, I mean, when I could just have paid uh, 30, 50 bob. To someone, 50 bob was nothing, but 50 shillings times 20, that time was 1,000. I was saving that 1,000. Every, every time you could get so that you can get yes, to the master's. Exactly. And I was keeping lunch and having tea in the office so that I could save this 15,000 every month. Because, you know, and that's why I say I started learning about money at a very young age. Because, uh, I mean, I could have spent 3,000 for lunch, 4,000 for transport. I could only be, uh, I could be using 15 and saving 5K. Which but I made sacrifices to be where I am and uh, I'm still heavy on saving and business and investing and uh, someone, you can never say money is too little. I have seen uh, a guy who was earning 6,000, save 3,000 every month, go to a tailoring school and learn to do tailoring. And uh, right now, here on Gong Road, the guy makes tents in his own company. Nice. 
So the guy was earning 6,000. Yeah. A but on story upon the Kavita Buga, sir. You're an author. Yeah. So I'm a published author. I've written a book on my own story. Wow, oh, but that one is printed and published. Then I have also published all the plays that I have written, around six of them. I have published them. Where can we find Not them? printed them. I've just published them like for copyright purposes. Yeah. Who does the owner? Who does the owner? Yeah, but I mean, if somebody needs to have them, at least I can easily say this one was copyrighted in 2019, 2020. Yeah, I think, yeah, we need to publish copyright and, and, and do all that kind of stuff because uh, right now, especially, the Americans and the Europeans are coming to Africa for stories for their films. And they're coming and talking to you, Sheila, and you tell them a story like, oh, yeah, by the way, and then they go and script it. Script your story so that you, they want the story, tell them, oh, I can give you this. But Yeah, so that in case they go do it, you say, they did it this year, I copyrighted it in 2016. Yeah, right now, mm -mm. we have to be selfish. We need to learn how to protect our copyright property. Yeah. Intellectual property. Intellectual property. We have so much intellectual property, especially our intangible cultural heritage, yeah. our myths and the mythologies. You know, all these Black Panther stories are real stories for Africans. They're not fiction. True. For the world, it's fiction. For us, it's a reality. It's, it's an everyday reality. And uh, I wish they could be able to put it on screen and say true story from, you know, you watch a film and it's written true story from Nigeria. Why can't they give us Africans the credit of this a true story from Nigeria as narrated by Dr. Zipi Okot? Because, I mean, in the film credits, it, there is story by, created yes. by, yes. script by, yes. screenplay by. Why aren't they crediting the story by? The owners of the story. Yes. So that we only have a screenplay, screenplay. I mean, where's the story by? The story by. Exactly. They are, are our, for us, it's a very true story. Stories about our origin, about Mumbi, about Ramogi, about Kitmikai, for us are true, real stories. When are we going to make those to begin with before they come and steal them? Yeah. It happened to funding in Akujia. This is where funding comes. I have, I have actually scripted uh, two Lua mythologies, of course, Tigo, which is a stage play. Mm -hmm. I have uh, scripted it also as a screenplay. But, you know, a lot of these mythology stories are films with crowd scenes. And uh, right. as long as you have crowd scenes in a movie, it means it's high it budget. Up. The bread goes up exactly. automatically. Exactly. So I have uh, scripted them into screenplay, of course, saying story from the Lua mythology on origin, yeah. Lua mythology of migration. You get those kind of stuff. You have to give credit to the source. Because once it's an intangible cultural heritage, it's a community position. Yeah. And so you can do that story as much as you want, but you have a way of giving back to this community. Maybe as a filmmaker, all you may need to give back to the community is train some young people on films, screen the film to the locals and, and stuff like that. But you are giving them, that is a proceed from the film. Yes. Yeah. So personally, I have scripted, if only I had the money, but I hope. All communities in Kenya have a have have a, an origin story, an or, or, yeah. a story of origination. Exactly. And then we have our own superheroes in those particular exactly. films and stories. Yes. Why aren't we telling this? They're so rich. Yeah. They're so they they give us identity. Yes. So why don't we fund them? Why haven't we found a way of bringing them to? Because the people with money don't trust the creatives yet. I use the word yet. 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 Yeah. And it's for two reasons. One is because we have not made them understand us. Yes. <laughs> we can't just blame them for not understanding us, but we've also not made them understand us. Uh, we have not pitched to them to make them understand the level of what we do and how we want it done. Mm -hmm. Then uh, also they have never looked at us differently. That's why for me, going to school to study creative arts is very important. It's important not even to build talent, but just to change perception. So that when you sit in a room and somebody says you studied theater arts, they can listen. You get what I mean? Yes. They can listen. It's, it's simply for that. It's like 
it even not even creative arts. People live with perceptions. You walk into a room, these are all business people. Uh, this one studied a uh, certificate in business. This one is, uh, has a master's from Harvard in certificate. People will listen to the Harvard model. Oh, leave you there. You know, it, and, and it's humans. Bring it even down. When you go to Shards, no matter how great your ideas are, if you don't have money, people don't listen to you, it's isn't true. it? So we can't even blame the investors on that. So we need people to go to school just so that we can have a seat at the table. Yeah, it's not, it's not about talent. I can do this. No, I mean, we are highly skilled. We are highly talented. But we need to sit at that table so that they can trust us with their money. So, and the only way is we go to school so that they can tell us to sit there. And for me, that's the campaign I'm having right now. I'm telling even established filmmakers, you can't keep doing something the same way and expect, expect return. Change. We are crying that our policy, we're not getting funding. It's not because we don't have talent. It's not because they don't listen to us. It's because after they've listened to us and they go up there, we don't have anyone at that who on is that Dr. table. Who are you talking to? Yeah, they're like, oh, they say that they need. Who is they? Exactly. We need somebody at that table to say, we talk to them and we need. Somebody to have a voice of we, I am here to represent them. Since 2012, we had our first graduates in film from KU. And now we have had many every year. We have enough trained people in the industry. For me, it's just my hope that they are not ending to work in other sectors. I hope they have the confidence to take the risk to be here in the film industry. Yeah, because we have enough trained people. Mm -hmm. We have enough trained people. As in, let me say, through the people I know I have taught in class, we have got over 5,000 graduates wow. in the country currently. I mean. That it's 10 years. Thing. That's a huge number. Yeah. That's a huge and uh, for me, I believe training in film has changed the scope because that's why we are even winning international awards. Tell me one international film award that does not have a, a graduate of film. Because before we started graduating people, we were not winning these things. We were, we were doing our own thing. Yeah. <laughs> we were not winning those things. And it, so when someone tells I say tr film training works. I mean, there isn't Kalasha. The students were shining. There. Not even the students. Look, look at the students. Start to, all the people who won there, in fact, 80% have gone through film training. Yeah. Akina Philip Karanja, yeah. and the graduates of KMC. Give me more. Me? Yes, you. <laughs> Ahmed <laughs> Farah studied film. Yes. As in, Abdi studied film. Abdi studied film. Look at that. Yeah, didn't study film. Didn't study As in, tell me who won there. Even uh, Nyokabi went to New York Film School. Tell me who won on that platform Did not that has not gone to any film school. Film training works. And it's what's changing the industry. And people, people are trying to pretend they can't see it. It is a fact. We have had graduates <laughs> the last 10 years. And it's changing the perception and attitudes of people towards film. Tell us one more time where to find you, what you're working on. And uh, huh. I'm Dr. Zipio Koth. I'm a lecturer of film at KCA University. I am a filmmaker. How are you doing? <laughs> I am working on quite a number of films right now. Some are in post-production. Sisters Alone is on post-production. And I am working on some more um, in future. I hope to do two films per year. You and me both. I hope to do one. Yeah. Uh, I hope to do it. It's a hope. I have to set my target higher. What is that? For one That's it. or two? No, you see, the problem is like putting one. In you just said one. No, you might not do that. Okay, then let's do three. And yeah, then three, at least you do one. do one and a half. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I'm working on quite a number of films. I'm scripting uh, and I am looking for funds to do many scripts that I, I have. I am looking at co-production with many filmmakers, financiers, partners, investors. And when I talk about investors, I just don't mean people who understand film. I'm talking about working with banks, working with uh, parastatals to create films that Kenyans enjoy and um, just to break through. I believe in film, we can reach out to many people through employment, through the message. Yeah. Do what makes you happy. There you go, guys. You have it. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fanaya Wafen. We have 
had our lovely, lovely guest, Dr. Z.P. Ogot. And thanks, Sheila, for having me. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence <laughs> and your aura. You're wonderful. Thank you so much. Have fun to find. See you next time, guys. And... Bye-bye. <laughs>